Section 1 of Three Ghost Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Ghost Stories by Charles Dickens. Section 1 The Signal Man. Hello, below there. When he heard a voice thus calling to him, he was standing at the door of his box, with a flag in his hand, furled round its short pole. One would have thought, considering the nature of the ground, that he could not have doubted from what quarter the voice came. But instead of looking up to where I stood on the top of the steep cutting nearly over his head, he turned himself about, and looked down the line. There was something remarkable in his manner of doing so though I could not have said for my life what. But I know it was remarkable enough to attract my notice, even though his figure was foreshortened and shadowed down in the deep trench, and mine was high above him, so steep did the glow of an angry sunset that I had shaded my eyes with my hand before I saw him at all. Hello! Below! From looking down the line, he turned himself about again, and, raising his eyes, saw my figure high above him. "'Is there any path by which I can come down and speak to you?' He looked up at me without replying, and I looked down at him without pressing him too soon with a repetition of my idle question. Just then there came a vague vibration in the earth and air, quickly changing into a violent pulsation, and an oncoming rush that caused me to start back, as though it had force to draw me down. When such vapour as rose to my height from this rapid train had passed me, and was skimming away over the landscape, I looked down again, and saw him refurling the flag he had shown while the train went by. I repeated my inquiry. After a pause, during which he seemed to regard me with fixed attention, he motioned his rolled-up flag towards a point on my level, some two or three hundred yards distant. I called down to him. All right, and made for that point. There, by dint of looking closely about me, I found a rough zigzag descending path notched out, which I followed. The cutting was extremely deep, and unusually precipitate. It was made through a clammy stone, that became oozier and wetter as I went down. For these reasons, I found the way long enough to give me time to recall a singular air of reluctance or compulsion with which he had pointed out the path. When I came down low enough upon the zigzag descent to see him again, I saw that he was standing between the rails on the way by which the train had lately passed, in an attitude as if he were waiting for me to appear. He had his left hand at his chin, and that left elbow rested on his right hand, crossed over his breast. His attitude was one of such expectation and watchfulness that I stopped a moment, wondering at it. I resumed my downward way, and stepping out upon the level of the railroad, and drawing nearer to him, saw that he was a dark, sallow man, with a dark beard and rather heavy eyebrows. His post was in a solitary and dismal a place as ever I saw. On either side, a dripping wet wall of jagged stone, excluding all view but a strip of sky, the perspective one way, only a crooked prolongation of this great dungeon, the shorter perspective in the other direction, terminating in a gloomy red light, and the gloomier entrance to a black tunnel, in whose massive architecture there was a barbarous, depressing and forbidding air. So little sunlight ever found its way to this spot, that it had an earthy deadly smell, and so much cold wind rushed through it, that it struck chill to me, as if I had left the natural world. Before he stirred, I was near enough to have touched him. Not even then removing his eyes from mine, he stepped back one step, and lifted his hand. This was a lonesome post to occupy, I said, and it had riveted my attention when I looked down from up yonder. A visitor was a rarity, I should suppose, not an unwelcome rarity, I hoped. In me, he merely saw a man who had been shut up within narrow limits all his life and who, being at last set free, had a newly awakened interest in these great works. To such purpose I spoke to him. 
but I am far from sure of the terms I used. For, besides that I am not happy in opening any conversation, there was something in the man that daunted me. He directed a most curious look towards the red light near the tunnel's mouth, and looked all about it, as if something were missing from it, and then looked at me. That light was part of his charge, was it not? He answered in a low voice. Don't you know it is? The monstrous thought came into my mind, as I perused the fixed eyes and the saturnine face, that this was a spirit, not a man. I have speculated since, whether there may have been infection in his mind. In my turn, I stepped back, but in making the action, I detected in his eyes some latent fear of me. This put the monstrous thought to flight. You look at me, I said, forcing a smile, as if you had a dread of me. I was doubtful, he returned, whether I had seen you before. Where? He pointed to the red light he had looked at. There? I said. Intently watchful of me, he replied, but without sound, yes. My good fellow, what should I do there? However, be that as it may, I never was there, you may swear. I think I may, he rejoined. Yes, I am sure I may. His manner cleared, like my own. He replied to my remarks with readiness, and in well-chosen words. Had he much to do there? Yes. That was to say, he had enough responsibility to bear. But exactness and watchfulness were what was required of him. And of actual work, manual labor, he had next to none. To change that signal, to trim those lights, and to turn this iron handle now and then was all he had to do under that head. Regarding those many long and lonely hours, of which I seemed to make so much, he could only say that the routine of his life had shaped itself into that form, and he had grown used to it. He had taught himself a language down here, if only to know it by sight, and to have formed his own crude ideas of its pronunciation could be called learning it. He had also worked at fractions and decimals, and tried a little algebra. But he was, and had been as a boy, a poor hand at figures. Was it necessary for him, when on duty, always to remain in that channel of damp air, and could he never rise into the sunshine from between those high stone walls? Why, that depended upon times and circumstances. Under some conditions, there would be less upon the line than under others, and the same held good as to certain hours of the day and night. In bright weather, he did choose occasions for getting a little above these lower shadows, but being at all times liable to be called by his electric bell, and at such times listening for it with redoubled anxiety, the relief was less than I would suppose. He took me into his box, where there was a fire, a desk for an official book in which he had to make certain entries, a telegraphic instrument with its dial, face, and needles, and the little bell of which he had spoken. On my trusting that he would excuse the remark that he had been well educated, and, I hoped I might say without offence, perhaps educated above that station, he observed that instances of slight incongruity in such wise would rarely be found wanting among large bodies of men, that he had heard it was so in workhouses, in the police force, even in that last desperate resource, the army, and that he knew it was so, more or less, in any great railway staff. He had been, when young, if I could believe it, sitting in that hut, he scarcely could, a student of natural philosophy, and had attended lectures. But he had run wild, misused his opportunities, gone down, and never risen again. He had no complaint to offer about that. He had made his bed, and he lay upon it. It was far too late to make another. All that I have here condensed, he said in a quiet manner, with his grave, dark regards divided between me and the fire. He threw in the word, Sir, from time to time, and especially when he referred to his youth, as though to request me to understand that he claimed to be nothing but what I found him. He was several times interrupted by the little bell, and had to read off messages and send replies. Once he had to stand without the door, and display a flag as a train passed, 
and make some verbal communication to the driver. In the discharge of his duties, I observed him to be remarkably exact and vigilant, breaking off his discourse at a syllable, and remaining silent until what he had to do was done. In a word, I should have set this man down as one of the safest of men to be employed in that capacity, but for the circumstance that while he was speaking to me, he twice broke off with a fallen colour, turned his face towards the little bell when it did not ring, opened the door of the hut, which was kept shut to exclude the unhealthy damp, and looked out towards the red light near the mouth of the tunnel. On both of those occasions, he came back to the fire with the inexplicable air upon him which I had remarked, without being able to define, when we were so far asunder. Said I, when I rose to leave him, You almost make me think that I have met with a contented man. I am afraid I must acknowledge that I said it to lead him on. I believe I used to be so, he rejoined in the low voice in which he had first spoken. But I am troubled, sir, I am troubled. He would have recalled the words if he could. He had said them, however, and I took them up quickly. With what? What is your trouble? It is very difficult in part, sir. It is very, very difficult to speak of. If you ever make me another visit, I will try to tell you. But I expressly intend to make you another visit. Say, when shall it be? I go off early in the morning, and I shall be on again at ten tomorrow night, sir. I will come at eleven. He thanked me, and went out at the door with me. I'll show you my white light, sir, he said in his peculiar low voice, till you have found the way up. When you have found it, don't call out. And when you are at the top, don't call out. His manner seemed to make the place strike colder to me, but I said no more than very well. And when you come down tomorrow night, don't call out. Let me ask you a parting question. What made you cry, hello, below there, tonight? Heaven knows, said I. I cried something to that effect. Not to that effect, sir. Those were the very words. I know them well. Admit those were the very words. I said them, no doubt, because I saw you below. For no other reason? What other reason could I possibly have? You had no feeling that they were conveyed to you in any supernatural way? No. He wished me good night, and held up his light. I walked by the side of the down line of rails, with a very disagreeable sensation of a train coming behind me, until I found the path. It was easier to mount than to descend, and I got back to my inn without any adventure. Punctual to my appointment, I placed my foot on the first notch of the zigzag next night, as the distant clocks were striking eleven. He was waiting for me at the bottom with his white light on. I have not called out, I said, when we came close together. May I speak now? By all means, sir. Good night, then, and here's my hand. Good night, sir, and here's mine. With that we walked side by side to his box, entered it, closed the door, and sat down by the fire. I have made up my mind, sir, he began, bending forward as soon as we were seated and speaking in a tone but a little above a whisper, that you shall not have to ask me twice what troubles me. I took you for someone else yesterday evening. That troubles me. That mistake? No, that someone else. Who is it? I don't know. Like me? I don't know. I never saw the face. The left arm is across the face, and the right arm is waved, violently waved, this way. I followed his action with my eyes, and it was the action of an arm gesticulating, with the utmost passion and vehemence. For God's sake, clear the way. One moonlight night, said the man, I was sitting here, when I heard a voice cry, Hello, below there. I started up, looked from that door, and saw this someone else standing by the red light near the tunnel, waving as I just now showed you. The voice seemed hoarse with shouting, and it cried, Look out, look out. And then again, Hello, below there, look out. I caught up my lamp, turned it on red, and ran towards the figure, calling, What's wrong? What has happened? Where? It stood just outside the blackness of the tunnel. 
they advanced so close upon it that I wondered at its keeping the sleeve across its eyes. I ran right up at it, and had my hand stretched out to pull the sleeve away, when it was gone. "'Into the tunnel?' said I. No. I ran on into the tunnel, five hundred yards. I stopped, and held my lamp above my head, and saw the figures of the measured distance, and saw the wet stains stealing down the walls and trickling through the arch. I ran out again faster than I had run in, for I had a mortal abhorrence of the place upon me. And I looked all round the red light with my own red light, and I went up the iron ladder to the gallery at top of it. And I came down again, and ran back here. I telegraphed both ways. An alarm has been given. Is anything wrong? The answer came back, both ways. All well. Resisting the slow touch of a frozen finger, tracing out my spine, I showed him how that this figure must be a deception of his sense of sight, and how that figures, originating in disease of the delicate nerves that minister to the functions of the eye, were known to have often troubled patients, some of whom had become conscious of the nature of the reflection, and had even proved it by experiments upon themselves. As to an imaginary cry, said I, do but listen for a moment to the wind in this unnatural valley while we speak so low, and to the wild harp it makes of the telegraph wires. That was all very well, he returned, after we had sat listening for a while, and he ought to know something of the wind and the wires. He, who so often passed long winter nights there, alone and watching, but he would beg to remark that he had not finished. I asked his pardon, and he slowly added these words, touching my arm. Within six hours after the appearance, the memorable accident on this line happened. And within ten hours, the dead and wounded were brought along through the tunnel over the spot where the figure had stood. A disagreeable shudder crept over me, but I did my best against it. It was not to be denied, I rejoined, that this was a remarkable coincidence, calculated deeply to impress his mind. But it was unquestionable that remarkable coincidences did continually occur and they must be taken into account in dealing with such a subject. Though to be sure I must admit, I added, for I thought I saw that he was going to bring the objection to bear upon me. Men of common sense did not allow much for coincidences in making the ordinary calculations of life. He again begged to remark that he had not finished. I again begged his pardon for being betrayed into interruptions. This, he said, again laying his hand upon my arm, and glancing over his shoulder with hollow eyes, was just a year ago. Six or seven months passed, and I had recovered from the surprise and shock, when one morning, as the day was breaking, I, standing at the door, looked towards the red light, and saw the spectre again. He stopped with a fixed look at me. Did it cry out? No. It was silent. Did it wave its arm? No. It leaned against the shaft of the light, with both hands before the face, like this. Once more I followed his action with my eyes. It was an action of mourning. I have seen such an attitude in stone figures on tombs. Did you go up to it? I came in and sat down, partly to collect my thoughts, partly because it had turned me faint. When I went to the door again, daylight was above me, and the ghost was gone. But nothing followed, nothing came off this. He touched me on the arm with his forefinger twice or thrice, giving a ghastly nod each time. That very day, as a train came out of the tunnel, I noticed, at a carriage window on my side, what looked like a confusion of hands and heads, and something waved. I saw it just in time to signal the driver, stop. He shut off, and put his brake on, but the train drifted past here a hundred and fifty yards or more. I ran after it, and, as I went along, heard terrible screams and cries. A beautiful young lady had died instantaneously in one of the compartments, and was brought in here, and laid down on this floor between us. Involuntarily I pushed my chair back, as I looked from the boards at which he pointed to himself. True, sir, true, precisely as it happened, so I tell it you. I could think of nothing to say, to any purpose, and my mouth was very dry. 
the wind and the wires took up the story with a long lamenting wail. He resumed, Now, sir, mark this, and judge how my mind is troubled. The spectre came back a week ago. Ever since it has been there, now and again, by fits and starts. At the light? At the danger light. What does it seem to do? He repeated, if possible, with increased passion and vehemence, that former gesticulation of, for God's sake, clear the way. Then he went on. I had no peace or rest for it. It calls to me, for many minutes together, in an agonized manner. Below there, look out, look out. It stands waving to me. It rings my little bell. I caught at that. Did it ring your bell yesterday evening when I was here, and you went to the door? Twice. Why, see? said I, how your imagination misleads you. My eyes were on the bell, and my ears were open to the bell. And if I am a living man, it did not ring at those times, no, nor at any other time, except when it was rung in the natural course of physical things by the station communicating with you. He shook his head. I have never made a mistake as to that yet, sir. I have never confused the spectre's ring with the man's. The ghost's ring is a strange vibration in the bell, that it derives from nothing else. And I have not asserted that the bell stirs to the eye. I don't wonder that you failed to hear it, but I heard it. And did the spectre seem to be there when you looked out? It was there. Both times? He repeated firmly. Both times. Will you come to the door with me and look for it now? He bit his underlip as though he were somewhat unwilling, but arose. I opened the door, and stood on the step, while he stood in the doorway. There was the danger light. There was the dismal mouth of the tunnel. There were the high, wet stone walls of the cutting. There were the stars above them. Do you see it? I asked him, taking particular note of his face. His eyes were prominent and strained, but not very much more so, perhaps, than my own had been when I had directed them earnestly towards the same spot. No, he answered. It is not there. Agreed, said I. We went in again, shut the door, and resumed our seats. I was thinking how best to improve this advantage, if it might be called one, when he took up the conversation in such a matter-of-course way, so assuming that there could be no serious question of fact between us, that I felt myself placed in the weakest of positions. By this time you will fully understand, sir, he said, that what troubles me so dreadfully is the question, what does the spectre mean? I was not sure, I told him, that I did fully understand. What is its warning against? He said, ruminating, with his eyes on the fire, and only by times turning them on me. What is the danger? Where is the danger? There is danger overhanging somewhere on the line. Some dreadful calamity will happen. It is not to be doubted this third time, after what has gone before. But surely this is a cruel haunting of me. What can I do? He pulled out his handkerchief, and wiped the drops from his heated forehead. If I telegraph danger on either side of me, or on both, I can give no reason for it. He went on, wiping the palms of his hands. I should get into trouble, and do no good. They would think I was mad. This is the way it would work. Message. Danger. Take care. Answer. What danger? Where? Message. Don't know. But for God's sake, take care. They would displace me. What else could they do? His pain of mind was most pitiable to see. It was the mental torture of a conscientious man, oppressed beyond endurance by an unintelligible responsibility involving life. When it first stood under the danger light, he went on, putting his dark hair back from his head, and drawing his hands outward across and across his temples in an extremity of feverish distress. Why not tell me where that accident was to happen, if it must happen? Why not tell me how it could be averted, if it could have been averted? When on its second coming it hid its face, why not tell me instead, She is going to die. Let them keep her at home. If it came on those two occasions, only to show me that its warnings were true, and so to prepare me for the third, why not warn me plainly now? And I, Lord help me, a mere poor signal man on this solitary station, why not go to somebody with credit to be believed and power to act? When I saw him in this state, I saw that for the poor man's sake, as well as for the public safety, what I had to do for the time was to compose his mind. Therefore, 
setting aside all question of reality or unreality between us, I represented to him that whoever thoroughly discharged his duty must do well, and that at least it was his comfort that he understood his duty, though he did not understand these confounding appearances. In this effort I succeeded far better than in the attempt to reason him out of his conviction. He became calm. The occupations incidental to his post as the night advanced began to make larger demands on his attention, and I left him at two in the morning. I had offered to stay through the night, but he would not hear of it. That I more than once looked back at the red light as I ascended the pathway, that I did not like the red light, and that I should have slept but poorly if my bed had been under it, I see no reason to conceal. Nor did I like the two sequences of the accident and the dead girl. I see no reason to conceal that either. But what ran most in my thoughts was the consideration how ought I to act, having become the recipient of this disclosure. I had proved the man to be intelligent, vigilant, painstaking, and exact, but how long might he remain so, in his state of mind? Though in a subordinate position, still he held a most important trust, and would I, for instance, like to stake my own life on the chances of his continuing to execute it with precision? Unable to overcome a feeling that there would be something treacherous in my communicating what he had told me to his superiors in the company, without first being plain with himself and proposing a middle course to him, I ultimately resolved to offer to accompany him, otherwise keeping his secret for the present, to the wisest medical practitioner we could hear of in those parts, and to take his opinion. A change in his time of duty would come round next night. He had apprised me, and he would be off an hour or two after sunrise, and on again soon after sunset. I had appointed to return accordingly. Next evening was a lovely evening, and I walked out early to enjoy it. The sun was not yet quite down when I traversed the field path near the top of the deep cutting. I would extend my walk for an hour, I said to myself, half an hour on and half an hour back and it would then be time to go to my signal-man's box. Before pursuing my stroll, I stepped to the brink, and mechanically looked down, from the point from which I had first seen him. I cannot describe the thrill that seized upon me, when, close at the mouth of the tunnel, I saw the appearance of a man, with his left sleeve across his eyes, passionately waving his arm. The nameless horror that oppressed me passed in a moment, for in a moment I saw, that this appearance of a man was a man indeed, and that there was a little group of other men, standing at a short distance, to whom he seemed to be rehearsing the gesture he made. The danger light was not yet lighted. Against its shaft, a little low hut, entirely new to me, had been made of some wooden supports and tarpaulin. It looked no bigger than a bed. With an irresistible sense that something was wrong, with a flashing self-reproachful fear that fatal mischief had come of my leaving the man there, and causing no one to be sent to overlook or correct what he did, I descended the notched path with all the speed I could make. "'What is the matter?' I asked the man. "'Signal man killed this morning, sir.' "'Not the man belonging to that box?' "'Yes, sir. Not the man I know. You will recognize him, sir, if you knew him.' said the man who spoke for the others, solemnly uncovering his own head, and raising an end of the tarpaulin, for his face is quite composed. "'Oh, how did this happen? How did this happen?' I asked, turning from one to another as the hut closed again. "'He was cut down by an engine, sir. No man in England knew his work better, but somehow he was not clear of the outer rail. It was just at broad day. He had struck the light, and had the lamp in his hand, as the engine came out of the tunnel. His back was towards her, and she cut him down. That man drove her, and was showing how it happened. Show the gentleman, Tom. The man, who wore a rough dark dress, stepped back to his former place at the mouth of the tunnel. Coming round the curve in the tunnel, sir, he said. I saw him at the end, like as if I saw him down a perspective glass. There was no time to check speed, and I knew him to be very careful. As he didn't seem to take heed of the whistle, I shut it off when we were running down upon him, and called to him as loud as I could call. What did you say? I said, Below there, look out, look out, for God's sake, clear the way. I started. Ah, it was a dreadful time, sir. I never left off calling to him. I put this arm before my eyes not to see, and I waved this arm to the last, but it was no use. Without prolonging the narrative to dwell on any of its curious circumstances more than on any other, 
I may, in closing it, point out the coincidence that the warning of the engine-driver included, not only the words which the unfortunate signal-man had repeated to me as haunting him, but also the words which I myself, not he, had attached, and that only in my own mind, to the gesticulation he had imitated. End of section 1「2 2A of Three Ghost Stories」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marion Brown. Three Ghost Stories by Charles Dickens. The Haunted House, Chapter 1 The Mortals in the House. Under none of the accredited ghostly circumstances, and environed by none of the conventional ghostly surroundings, did I first make acquaintance with the house which is the subject of this Christmas piece. I saw it in the daylight with the sun upon it. There was no wind, no rain, no lightning, no thunder, no awful or unwanted circumstance of any kind to heighten its effect. More than that, I had come to it direct from a railway station— it was not more than a mile distant from the railway station, and as I stood outside the house, looking back upon the way I had come, I could see the goods train running smoothly along the embankment in the valley. I will not say that everything was utterly commonplace, because I doubt if anything can be that, except to utterly commonplace people, and there my vanity steps in. But I will take it on myself to say that anybody might see the house as I saw it, any fine autumn morning. The manner of my lighting on it was this. I was travelling towards London out of the north, intending to stop by the way to look at the house. My health required a temporary residence in the country, and a friend of mine who knew that, and who had happened to drive past the house, had written to me to suggest it as a likely place. I had got into the train at midnight, and had fallen asleep, and had woke up, and had sat looking out of the window at the brilliant northern lights in the sky, and had fallen asleep again, and had woke up again to find the night gone, with the usual discontented conviction on me that I hadn't been to sleep at all, upon which question, in the first imbecility of that condition, I am ashamed to believe that I would have done wager by battle with the man who sat opposite me. That opposite man had had, through the night, as that opposite man always has, several legs too many, and all of them too long. In addition to this unreasonable conduct, which was only to be expected of him, he had had a pencil and a pocket-book, and had been perpetually listening and taking notes. It had appeared to me that these aggravating notes related to the jolts and bumps of the carriage, and I should have resigned myself to his taking them, under a general supposition that he was in the civil engineering way of life, if he had not sat staring straight over my head whenever he listened. He was a goggle-eyed gentleman of a perplexed aspect, and his demeanour became unbearable. It was a cold, dead morning, the sun not being up yet, and when I had outwatched the paling light of the fires of the iron country, and the curtain of heavy smoke that hung at once between me and the stars and between me and the day, I turned to my fellow traveller and said, I beg your pardon, sir, but do you observe anything particular in me? For really he appeared to be taking down either my travelling cap or my hair, with a minuteness that was a liberty. The goggle-eyed gentleman withdrew his eyes from behind me, as if the back of the carriage were a hundred miles off and said with a lofty look of compassion for my insignificance, "'In you, sir? B. B, sir?' said I, growing warm. "'I have nothing to do with you, sir,' returned the gentleman. "'Pray, let me listen. Oh!' He enunciated this vowel after a pause, and noted it down. At first I was alarmed, for an express lunatic and no communication with the guard is a serious position." The thought came to my relief that the gentleman might be what is popularly called a rapper, 
one of a sect for some of whom I have the highest respect, but whom I don't believe in. I was going to ask him the question when he took the bread out of my mouth. You will excuse me, said the gentleman contemptuously, if I am too much in advance of common humanity to trouble myself at all about it. I have passed the night, as indeed I pass the whole of my time now, in spiritual intercourse. Oh, said I somewhat snappishly, the conferences of the night began, continued the gentleman, turning several leaves of his notebook with this message. Evil communication corrupt good manners. Sound, said I, but absolutely new. New from spirits, returned the gentleman. I could only repeat my rather snappish O, oh, and ask if I might be favoured with the last communication. A bird in the hand, said the gentleman, reading his last entry with great solemnity, is worth two in the bosh. Truly I am of the same opinion, said I, but shouldn't it be bush? It came to me bosh, returned the gentleman. The gentleman then informed me that the spirit of Socrates had delivered this special revelation in the course of the night. My friend, I hope you are pretty well. There are two in this railway carriage. How do you do? There are 17,479 spirits here, but you cannot see them. Pythagoras is here. He is not at liberty to mention it, but hopes you like traveling. Galileo likewise had dropped in, with this scientific intelligence. I am glad to see you, amico. Kamasta? Water will freeze when it is cold enough. Adio. In the course of the night, also, the following phenomena had occurred. Bishop Butler had insisted on spelling his name Bubbler, for which offence against orthography and good manners he had been dismissed as out of temper. John Milton, suspected of willful mystification, had repudiated the authorship of Paradise Lost, and had introduced, as joint authors of that poem, two unknown gentlemen, respectively named Grungers and Scaddington, and Prince Arthur, nephew of King John of England, had described himself as tolerably comfortable in the seventh circle, where he was learning to paint on velvet under the direction of Mrs. Trimmer and Mary, Queen of Scots. If this should meet the eye of the gentleman who favoured me with these disclosures, I trust he will excuse my confessing that the sight of the rising sun, and the contemplation of the magnificent order of the vast universe, made me impatient of them. In a word, I was so impatient of them that I was mightily glad to get out at the next station, and to exchange these clouds and vapours for the free air of heaven. By that time it was a beautiful morning. As I walked away among such leaves as had already fallen from the golden brown and russet trees, and as I looked around me on the wonders of creation, and thought of the steady, unchanging, and harmonious laws by which they are sustained, the gentleman's spiritual intercourse seemed to me as poor a piece of journey-work as ever this world saw. In which heathen state of mind I came within view of the house, and stopped to examine it attentively. It was a solitary house, standing in a sadly neglected garden, a pretty even square of some two acres. It was a house of about the time of George the Second, as stiff, as cold, as formal, and in as bad taste as could possibly be desired by the most loyal admirer of the whole quartet of George's. It was uninhabited, but had, within a year or two, been cheaply repaired to render it habitable. I say cheaply because the work had been done in a surface manner, and was already decaying as to the paint and plaster, though the colours were fresh. A lopsided board drooped over the garden wall, announcing that it was, to let on very reasonable terms, well furnished. It was much too closely and heavily shadowed by trees, and in particular there were six tall poplars before the front windows, which were excessively melancholy, and the sight of which had been extremely ill-chosen. It was easy to see that it was an avoided house, a house that was shunned by the village, to which my eye was guided by a church spire some half a mile off, a house that nobody would take, and the natural interference was that it had the reputation of being a haunted house. 
No period within the four and twenty hours of day and night is so solemn to me as the early morning. In the summer time, I often rise very early and repair to my room to do a day's work before breakfast. And I am always on those occasions deeply impressed by the stillness and solitude around me. Besides that, there is something awful in the being surrounded by familiar faces asleep, in the knowledge that those who are dearest to us, and to whom we are dearest, are profoundly unconscious of us, in an impassive state, anticipate of that mysterious condition to which we are all tending, the stopped life, the broken threads of yesterday, the deserted seat, the closed book, the unfinished but abandoned occupation. All are images of death. The tranquillity of the hour is the tranquillity of death. The color and the chill have the same association. Even a certain air that familiar household objects take upon themselves when they first merge with the shadows of the night into the morning, of being newer, as they used to be long ago, has its counterpart in the subsistence of the worn face of maturity, or age in death, into the old youthful look. Moreover, I once saw the apparition of my father at this hour. He was alive and well, and nothing ever came of it, but I saw him in the daylight, sitting with his back towards me, on a seat that stood beside my bed. His head was resting on his hand, and whether he was slumbering or grieving I could not discern. Amazed to see him there, I sat up, moved my position, leaned out of bed, and watched him. As he did not move, I spoke to him more than once. As he did not move then, I became alarmed, and laid my hand upon his shoulder, as I thought. And there was no such thing. For all these reasons, and for others less easily and briefly statable, I find the early morning to be my most ghostly time. Any house would be more or less haunted to me in the early morning, and a haunted house could scarcely address me to greater advantage than then. I walked on into the village, with the desertion of this house upon my mind, and I found the landlord of the little inn, sanding his doorstep. I bespoke breakfast, and broached the subject of the house. "'Is it haunted?' I asked. The landlord looked at me, shook his head, and answered, "'I say nothing.' "'Then it is haunted.' "'Well,' cried the landlord, in an outburst of frankness that had the appearance of desperation, "'I wouldn't sleep in it. "'Why not? "'If I wanted to have all the bells in a house ring, with nobody to ring him, "'and all the doors in a house bang, with nobody to bang him, "'and all sorts of feet treading about, with no feet there, "'why then,' said the landlord, "'I'd sleep in that house. "'Is anything seen there?' The landlord looked at me again, and then, with his former appearance of desperation, called down his stable-yard for Ikey. The call produced a high-shouldered young fellow, with a round red face, a short crop of sandy hair, a very broad humorous mouth, a turned-up nose, and a great sleeved waistcoat of purple bars, with mother-of-pearl buttons, that seemed to be growing upon him, and to be in a fair way, if it were not pruned of covering his head and overrunning his boots. "'This gentleman wants to know,' said the landlord, "'if anything's seen at the poplars.' "'Ooded woman with a howl,' said Ikey, in a state of great freshness. "'Do you mean a cry?' "'I mean a bird, sir. "'A hooded woman with an owl. "'Dear me! "'Did you ever see her? "'I seen the howl. "'Never the woman. "'Not so plain as the howl.' "'but they always keeps together. "'Has anybody ever seen the woman as plainly as the owl? "'Lord bless you, sir, lots. "'Who? "'Lord bless you, sir, lots. "'The general dealer opposite, for instance, "'who is opening his shop? "'Perkins, bless you, Perkins wouldn't go anigh the place. "'No,' observed the young man with considerable feeling. "'He ain't over-wise, ain't Perkins, "'but he ain't such a fool as that.' Here the landlord murmured his confidence in Perkins, knowing better. "'Who is, or who was, the hooded woman with the owl? Do you know?' "'Well,' said Ikey, holding up his cap with one hand, while he scratched his head with the other, "'they say in general that she was murdered, and the howl he ooted the while.' This very concise summary of the facts was all I could learn, 
except that a young man, as hearty and as likely a young man as ever I see, had been took with fits and held down in him after seeing the hooded woman. Also, that a personage, dimly described as a old chap, a sort of one-eyed tramp, answering to the name of Joby, unless you challenged him as Greenwood, and then he said, Why not? And even if so, mind your own business, had encountered the hooded woman a matter of five or six times. But I was not materially assisted by these witnesses, inasmuch as the first was in California, and the last was, as Ike said, and he was confirmed by the landlord, anywheres. Now, although I regard with a hushed and solemn fear the mysteries between which and this state of existence is interposed the barrier of the great trial and change that fall on all the things that live, and although I have not the audacity to pretend that I know anything of them, I can no more reconcile the mere banging of doors, ringing of bells, creaking of boards, and such like insignificances, with the majestic beauty and pervading analogy of all the divine rules that I am permitted to understand, that I have been able, a little while before, to yoke the spiritual intercourse of my fellow traveller in the chariot of the rising sun. Moreover, I had lived in two haunted houses, both abroad. In one of these, an old Italian palace, which bore the reputation of being very badly haunted indeed, and which had recently been twice abandoned on that account, I lived eight months, most tranquilly and pleasantly, notwithstanding that the house had a score of mysterious bedrooms, which were never used, and possessed in one large room in which I sat reading, times out of number at all hours, and next to which I slept, a haunted chamber of the first pretensions. I gently hinted these considerations to the landlord, and to this particular house, having a bad name, I reasoned with him. Why, how many things had bad names undeservedly, and how easy it was to give bad names, and did he not think that if he and I were persistently to whisper in the village that any weird-looking old drunken tinker of the neighborhood had sold himself to the devil, he would come in time to be suspected of that commercial venture? All this wise talk was perfectly ineffective with the landlord, I am bound to confess, and was as dead a failure as ever I made in my life." To cut this part of the story short, I was piqued about the haunted house, and was already half resolved to take it. So after breakfast I got the keys from Perkins's brother-in-law, a whip and harness maker who keeps the post office, and is under submission to a most rigorous wife of the doubly seceding little Emmanuel persuasion, and went up to the house, attended by my landlord and by Ike. Within I found it, as I had expected, transcendently dismal. The slowly changing shadows waved on it from the heavy trees, were doleful in the last degree. The house was ill-placed, ill-built, ill-planned, and ill-fitted. It was damp, it was not free from dry rot, and there was a flavor of rats in it, and it was the gloomy victim of that indescribable decay which settles on all the work of man's hands whenever it's not turned to man's account. The kitchens and offices were too large and too remote from each other, Above stairs and below, waste tracts of passage intervened between patches of fertility represented by rooms, and there was a mouldy old well with a green growth upon it, hiding like a murderous trap near the bottom of the back stairs, under the double row of bells. One of these bells was labelled, on a black ground in faded white letters, Master B. This, they told me, was the bell that rang the most. "'Who was Master B?' I asked. "'Is it known what he did while the owl hooted?' "'Rang the bell,' said Ike. "'I was rather struck by the prompt dexterity "'with which this young man pitched his fur cap at the bell "'and rang it himself. "'It was a loud, unpleasant bell "'and made a very disagreeable sound. "'The other bells were inscribed according to the names "'of the rooms to which their wires were conducted "'as picture-room, double-room, clock-room, and the like.' Following Master B.'s bell to its source, I found that young gentleman to have had but indifferent third-class accommodation in a triangular cabin under the cock loft, with a corner fireplace, which Master B. must have been exceedingly small if he were ever to warm himself at, and a corner chimney-piece like a pyramidal staircase to the ceiling for Tom Thumb. 
The papering of one side of the room had dropped down bodily, with fragments of plaster adhering to it, and almost blocked up the door. It appeared that Master B, in his spiritual condition, always made a point of pulling the paper down. Neither the landlord nor Ikey could suggest why he made such a fool of himself. Except that the house had an immensely large rambling loft at top, I made no other discoveries. It was moderately well furnished, but sparely. Some of the furniture, say a third, was as old as the house, and the rest was of various periods within the last half century. I was referred to a corn chandler in the market place of the county town to treat for the house. I went that day, and I took it for six months. It was just the middle of October when I moved in with my maiden sister. I ventured to call her eight and thirty. She is so very handsome, sensible, and engaging. We took with us a deaf stableman, my bloodhound Turk, two women servants, and a young person called an odd girl. I have reason to record of the attendant last enumerated, who was one of the St. Lawrence's Union female orphans, and that she was a fatal mistake and a disastrous engagement. The year was dying early. The leaves were falling fast. It was a raw, cold day when we took possession, and the gloom of the house was most depressing. The cook, an amiable woman, but of a weak turn of intellect, burst into tears on beholding the kitchen. And requested that her silver watch might be delivered over to her sister, to Tuppenstock's Gardens, Liggs Walk, Clapham Rise, in the event of anything happening to her from the damp. Streaker, the housemaid, feigned cheerfulness, but was the greater martyr. The odd girl, who had never been in the country, alone was pleased, and made arrangements for sowing an acorn in the garden outside the scullery window, and rearing an oak. We went before dark. Through all the natural as opposed to supernatural miseries incidental to our state, dispiriting reports ascended like the smoke from the basement in volumes and descended from the upper rooms. There was no rolling pin, there was no salamander, which failed to surprise me, for I don't know what it is. There was nothing in the house. What there was was broken. The last people must have lived like pigs. What could the meaning of the landlord be? Through these distresses, the odd girl was cheerful and exemplary, but within four hours after dark, we had got into a supernatural groove, and the odd girl had seen eyes and was in hysterics. My sister and I had agreed to keep the haunting strictly to ourselves, and my impression was and still is that I had not left Ikey when he helped to unload the cart alone with the women or any of them for one minute. Nevertheless, as I say, the odd girl had seen eyes. No other explanation could ever be drawn from her. Before nine and by ten o'clock, had had as much vintage applied to her as would pickle a handsome salmon. I leave a discerning public to judge of my feelings when, under these untoward circumstances, at about half past ten o'clock, Master B's bell began to ring in a most infuriated manner, and Turk howled until the house resounded with his lamentations. I hope I may never again be in a state of mind so unchristian as the mental frame in which I lived for some weeks, respecting the memory of Master B. Whether his bell was rung by rats or mice or bats or wind, or what other accidental vibration, or sometimes by one cause, sometimes another, and sometimes by collusion, I don't know. But certain it is that it did ring two nights out of three. Until I conceived the happy idea of twisting Master B's neck, in other words, breaking his bell off short and silencing that young gentleman, as to my experience and belief, forever. But by that time, the odd girl had developed such improving powers of catalepsy that she had become a shining example of that very inconvenient disorder. She would stiffen like a guy fox endowed with unreason on the most irrelevant occasions. I would address the servants in a lucid manner, pointing out to them that I had painted Master B's room and balked the paper, and taken Master B's bell away and balked the ringing, and if they could suppose that that confounded boy had lived and died to clothe himself with no better behavior than would most unquestionably have brought him with the sharpest particles of a birch broom into close acquaintance in the present imperfect state of existence. Could they also suppose a mere poor human being, such as I was, capable of these contemptible means of counteracting 
and limiting the powers of the disembodied spirits of the dead, or of any spirits, I say I would become emphatic and cogent, not to say rather complacent in such an address, when it would all go for nothing by reason of the odd girl suddenly stiffening from the toes upward and glaring among us like a parochial petrifaction. Streaker, the housemaid, too, had an attribute of a most discomfiting nature. I am unable to say whether she was of an unusually lymphatic temperament or what else was the matter with her, but this young woman became a mere distillery for the production of the largest and most transparent tears I have ever met with. Combined with these characteristics was a peculiar tenacity of hold in these specimens, so that they didn't fall but hung upon her face and nose. In this condition, and mildly and deplorably shaking her head, her silence would throw me more heavily than the admirable Crichton could have done in a verbal disputation for a purse of money. Cook, likewise, always covered me with confusion, as with a garment, by neatly winding up the session with the protest that the ouse was wearing her out, and by meekly repeating her last wishes regarding her silver watch. As to our nightly life, the contagion of suspicion and fear was among us. There is no such contagion under the sky. Hooded woman? According to the accounts, we were in a perfect convent of hooded women. Noises? With that contagion downstairs, I myself have sat in the dismal parlour listening, until I have heard so many and such strange noises that they would have chilled my blood if I had not been warned by dashing out to make discoveries. Try this in bed, in the dead of the night. Try this at your own comfortable fireside, in the life of the night. You can fill any house with noises, if you will, until you have a noise for every nerve in your nervous system. I repeat, the contagion of suspicion and fear was among us, and there is no such contagion under the sky. The women, their noses in a chronic state of excoriation from smelling salts, were always primed and loaded for a swoon, and ready to go off with hair triggers. The two elder detached the odd girl on all expeditions that were considered doubly hazardous, and she always established the reputation of such adventures by coming back cataleptic. If Cook or Streaker went overhead after dark, we knew we should presently hear a bump on the ceiling, and this took place so constantly that it was as if a fighting man were engaged to go about the house, administering a touch of his art, which I believe is called the auctioneer, to every domestic he met with. It was in vain to do anything. It was in vain to be frightened, for the moment in one's own person, by a real owl, and then to show the owl, it was in vain to discover, by striking as accidental discord on the piano, that Turk always howled at particular notes and combinations. It was in vain to be a Radamanthus with the bells, and if an unfortunate bell rang without leave, to have it down inexorably and silence it. It was in vain to fire up chimneys, let torches down the well, charge furiously into suspected rooms and recesses. We changed servants, and dejectedly said to my sister, We changed servants, and it was no better. The new set ran away, and a third set came, and it was no better. At last our comfortable housekeeping got to be so disorganized and wretched that I one night dejectedly said to my sister, Patty, I begin to despair of our getting people to go on with us here. I think we must give this up. My sister, who was a woman of immense spirit, replied, No, John, don't give it up. Don't be beaten, John. There is another way. "'And what is that?' said I. "'John,' returned my sister, "'if we are not to be driven out of this house, "'and that for no reason whatever that is apparent to you or me, "'we must help ourselves and take the house wholly and solely into our own hands. "'But the servants,' said I, "'have no servants,' said my sister boldly. "'Like most people in my grade of life, "'I had never thought of the possibility of going on "'without these faithful obstructions.' The notion was so new to me when suggested that I looked very doubtful. We know they come here to be frightened and infect one another, and we know they are frightened and do infect one another, said my sister. With the exception of bottles, I observed in a meditative tone, the deaf stable man, I kept him in my service and still keep him, 
as a phenomenon of moroseness not to be matched in England. "'To be sure, John,' assented my sister, "'except Bottles. "'And what does that go to prove? "'Bottles talks to nobody, and hears nobody, "'unless he is absolutely roared at. "'And what alarm has Bottles ever given or taken? "'None.' This was perfectly true. The individual in question having retired every night at ten o'clock to his bed over the coach-house, with no other company than a pitchfork and a pail of water, that the pail of water would have been over me and the pitchfork through me if I had put myself without announcement in Bottle's way after that minute, I had deposited in my own mind as a fact worth remembering. Neither had Bottle's ever taken the least notice of any of our many uproars, an imperturbable and speechless man, he had sat at his supper, with Streaker present in a swoon, and the old girl marble, and had only put another potato in his cheek, or profited by the general misery to help himself to beefsteak pie. And so, continued my sister, I exempt bottles, and considering, John, that the house is too large, and perhaps too lonely, to be well kept in hand by bottles, you and me— I propose that we cast about among our friends for a certain selected number of the most reliable and willing, form a society here for three months, wait upon ourselves and one another, live cheerfully and socially, and see what happens. I was so charmed with my sister that I embraced her on the spot, and went into her plan with the greatest ardor. We were then in the third week of November, but we took our measures so vigorously and were so well seconded by the friends in whom we confided, that there was still a week of the month unexpired, when our party all came down together merrily and mustered in the haunted house. I will mention in this place two small changes that I made while my sister and I were yet alone. It occurring to me as not improbable that Turk howled in the house at night, partly because he wanted to get out of it, I stationed him in his kennel outside, but unchained, and I seriously warned the village that any man who came in his way must not be expected to leave him without a rip in his own throat. I then casually asked Ikey if he were a judge of a gun. On his saying, Yes, sir, I knows a good gun when I sees her. I begged the favour of his stepping up to the house and looking at mine. She's a true one, sir, said Ikey, after inspecting a double-barreled rifle that I had bought in New York a few years ago. No mistake about her, sir. Ikey, said I, don't mention it. I have seen something in this house. No, sir, he whispered, greedily opening his eyes. Ooded lady, sir? Don't be frightened, said I. It was a figure rather like you. Lord, sir. Ikey, said I, shaking hands with him warmly, as I may say affectionately, if there is any truth in these ghost stories, the greatest service I can do you is to fire at that figure and I promise you by heaven and earth I will do it with this gun if I see it again. The young man thanked me, and took his leave with some little precipitation, after declining a glass of liquor. I imparted my secret to him, because I had never quite forgotten his throwing his cap at the bell, because I had on another occasion noticed something very like a fur cap lying not far from the bell one night when it had burst out ringing, and because I had remarked that we were at our ghostliest whenever he came up in the evening to comfort the servants. Let me do Ikey no injustice. He was afraid of the house, and believed in its being haunted, and yet he would play false on the haunting side, so surely as he got an opportunity. The odd girl's case was exactly similar. She went about the house in a state of real terror, and yet lied monstrously and willfully, and invented many of the alarms she spread, and made many of the sounds we heard. I had had my eye on the two, and I know it. It is not necessary for me here to account for this preposterous state of mind. I content myself with remarking that it is familiarly known to every intelligent one who has had fair medical, legal, or other watchful experience that it is as well established and as common a state of mind as any with which observers are acquainted and that it is one of the first elements, above all others, rationally to be suspected in, and strictly looked for, and separated from, any question of this kind. To return to our party, the first thing we did when we were all assembled was to draw lots for bedrooms. That done, and every bedroom, and indeed the whole house, having been minutely examined by the whole body, we allotted the various household duties, 
as if we had been on a gypsy party, or a yachting party, or a hunting party, or were shipwrecked. I then recounted the floating rumors concerning the hooded lady, the owl, and Master B, with others still more filmy, which had floated about during our occupation relative to some ridiculous old ghost of the female gender who went up and down carrying the ghost of a round table and also to an impalatable jackass whom nobody was ever able to catch. Some of these ideas I really believe our people below had communicated to one another in some diseased way without conveying them in words. We then gravely called one another to witness that we were not there to be deceived or to deceive which we'd considered pretty much the same thing, and that, with a serious sense of responsibility, we would be strictly true to one another, and would strictly follow out the truth. The understanding was established that any one who heard unusual noises in the night, and who wished to trace them, should knock at my door. Lastly, that on twelfth night, the last night of Holy Christmas, all our individual experiences since that then present hour of our coming together in the haunted house should be brought to light for the good of all and that we would hold our peace on the subject till then unless on some remarkable provocation to break silence we were in number and in character as follows first to get my sister and myself out of the way there were we too in the drawing of lots my sister drew her own room and i drew master b's next there was our first cousin, John Herschel, so called after the great astronomer than whom I suppose a better man at a telescope does not breathe. With him was his wife, a charming creature to whom he had been married in the previous spring. I thought it, under the circumstances, rather imprudent to bring her, because there is no knowing what even a false alarm may do at such a time. But I suppose he knew his own business best, and I must say that if she had been my wife, I never could have left her endearing and bright face behind. They drew the clock room. Alfred Starling, an uncommonly agreeable young fellow of eight and twenty, for whom I have the greatest liking, was in the double room. Mine, usually and designated by that name, from having a dressing room within it, with two large and cumbersome windows, which no wedges I was ever able to make, would keep from shaking in any weather, wind or no. Alfred is a young fellow who pretends to be fast, another word for loose as I understand the term, but who is much too good and sensible for that nonsense, and who would have distinguished himself before now if his father had not unfortunately left him a small independence of two hundred a year, on the strength of which his only occupation in life has been to spend six. I am in hopes, however, that his banker may break, or that he may enter into some speculation guaranteed to pay twenty per cent, for I am convinced that if he could only be ruined, his fortune is made. Belinda Bates, bosom friend of my sister, and a most intellectual, amiable, and delightful girl, got the picture room. She has a fine genius for poetry, combined with real business earnestness and goes in, to use an expression of Alfred's, for women's mission, women's rights, women's wrongs, and everything that is woman's with a capital W, or is not, and ought to be, or is, and ought not to be. Most praiseworthy, my dear, and heaven prosper you, I whispered to her on the first night of my taking leave of her at the picture-room door, but don't overdo it and in respect of the great necessity there is, my darling, for more employments being within the reach of women than our civilization has as yet assigned to her, don't fly at the unfortunate men, even those men who are at first sight in your way, as if they were the real oppressors of your sex. For trust me, Belinda, they do sometimes spend their wages among wives and daughters, sisters, mothers, aunts and grandmothers, and the play is really not all wolf and red riding hood but has other parts in it. However, I digress. Belinda, as I have mentioned, occupied the picture room. We had but three other chambers, the corner room, the cupboard room, and the garden room. My old friend Jack Governor slung his hammock, as he called it, in the corner room. I have always regarded Jack as the finest-looking sailor that ever sailed. He is grey now, but as handsome as he was a quarter of a century ago, nay, handsomer, 
a portly, cheery, well-built figure of a broad-shouldered man, with a frank smile, a brilliant dark eye, and a rich dark eyebrow. I remember those under darker hair, and they look all the better for their silver setting. He has been wherever his union namesake flies, has Jack, and I have met old shipmates of his, away in the Mediterranean and on the other side of the Atlantic, who have beamed and brightened at the casual mention of his name, and have cried, You know Jack Governor? Then you know a prince of men. That he is, and so unmistakably a naval officer, that if you were to meet him coming out of an Eskimo snow hut in a seal skin, you would be vaguely persuaded he was in full naval uniform. Jack once had that bright clear eye of his on my sister, but it fell out that he married another lady and took her to South America where she died. This was a dozen years ago or more. He brought down with him to our haunted house a little cask of salt beef, for he is always convinced that all salt beef, not of his own pickling, is mere carrion and invariably, when he goes to London, packs a piece in his portmanteau. He had also volunteered to bring with him one Nat Beaver, an old comrade of his, captain of a merchantman. Mr. Beaver, with a thick-set wooden face and figure, and apparently as hard as a block all over, proved to be an intelligent man, with a world of watery experiences in him and great practical knowledge. At times there was a curious nervousness about him, apparently the lingering result of some old illness, but it seldom lasted many minutes. He got the cupboard room, and lay there next to Mr. Undery, my friend and solicitor, who came down in an amateur capacity to go through with it, as he said, and who plays whist better than the whole law list, from the red cover at the beginning to the red cover at the end. I never was happier in my life, and I believe it was the universal feeling among us. Jack Governor, always a man of wonderful resources, was chief cook, and made some of the best dishes I ever ate, including unapproachable curries. My sister was pastry cook and confectioner. Starling and I were cook's mate, turn and turn about, and on special occasions the chief cook pressed Mr. Beaver. We had a great deal of outdoor sport and exercise, but nothing was neglected within, and there was no ill-humor or misunderstanding among us, and our evenings were so delightful that we had at least one good reason for being reluctant to go to bed. We had a few night alarms in the beginning. On the first night I was knocked up by Jack, with a most wonderful ship's lantern in his hand, like the gills of some monster of the deep who informed me that he was going aloft to the main truck to have the weather cock down. It was a stormy night, and I remonstrated, but Jack called my attention to its making a sound like a cry of despair, and said somebody would be hailing a ghost presently if it wasn't done. So up to the top of the house, where I could hardly stand for the wind, we went, accompanied by Mr. Beaver, and there Jack, lantern and all, with Mr. Beaver after him, swarmed up to the top of a cupola some two dozen feet above the chimneys and stood upon nothing particular coolly knocking the weathercock off until they both got into such good spirits with the wind and the height that i thought they would never come down another night they turned out again and had a chimney cowl off another night they cut a sobbing and gulping water pipe away another night they found out something else on several occasions they both, in the coolest manner, simultaneously dropped out of their respective bedroom windows, hand over hand by their counterpanes, to overhaul something mysterious in the garden. The engagement among us was faithfully kept, and nobody revealed anything. All we knew was, if anyone's room were haunted, no one looked the worse for it. End of Section 2A Section 2B of Three Ghost Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marion Brown. Three Ghost Stories by Charles Dickens. The Haunted House. Chapter 2. The Ghost in Master B.'s Room. When I established myself in the triangular garret which had gained so distinguished a reputation, my thoughts naturally turned to Master B. My speculations about him were uneasy and manifold. Whether his Christian name was Benjamin, by sextile, from his having been born in leap year, Bartholomew or Bill, whether the initial letter belonged to his family name, and that was Baxter, Black, Brown, Barker, Buggins, Baker, or Bird, whether he was a foundling and had been baptized B, whether he was a lion-hearted boy and B was short for Britain or for Bull, whether he could possibly have been kith and kin to an illustrious lady who brightened my own childhood and had come of the blood of the brilliant mother bunch. With these profitless meditations I tormented myself much. I also carried the mysterious letter into the appearance and pursuits of the deceased, wondering whether he dressed in blue, wore boots, he couldn't have been bald, was a boy of brains, liked books, was good at bowling, had any skill as a boxer, even in his buoyant boyhood bathed from a bathing machine at Bogner, Banger, Burnmouth, Brighton, or Broadstairs, like a bounding billiard ball? So from the first I was haunted by the letter B. It was not long before I remarked that I never by any hazard had a dream of Master B, or of anything belonging to him. But the instant I woke up from sleep, at whatever hour of the night, my thoughts took him up, and roamed away trying to attach his initial letter to something that would fit it and keep it quiet. For six days I had been worried thus in Master B's room, when I began to perceive that things were going wrong. The first appearance that presented itself was early in the morning, when it was but just daylight and no more. I was standing shaving at my glass, when I suddenly discovered to my consternation and amazement that I was shaving not myself, I am fifty, but a boy, apparently Master B. I trembled and looked over my shoulder, nothing there. I looked again in the glass and distinctly saw the features and expressions of a boy who was shaving, not to get rid of a beard, but to get one. Extremely troubled in my mind, I took a few turns in the room and went back to the looking-glass, resolved to study my hand and complete the operation in which I had been disturbed. Opening my eyes, which I had shut while recovering my firmness, I now met in the glass, looking straight at me, the eyes of a young man of four or five and twenty. Terrified by this new ghost, I closed my eyes and made a strong effort to recover myself. Opening them again, I saw, shaving his cheek in the glass, my father, who has long been dead. Nay, I even saw my grandfather, too, whom I never did see in my life. Although naturally much affected by these remarkable visitations, I determined to keep my secret until the time agreed upon for the present general disclosure. Agitated by a multitude of curious thoughts, I retired to my room that night, prepared to encounter some new experience of a spectral character. Nor was my preparation needless, for waking from an uneasy sleep at exactly two o'clock in the morning, what were my feelings to find that I was sharing my bed with the skeleton of Master B? I sprang up, and the skeleton sprang up also. I then heard a plaintive voice saying, Where am I? What is become of me? And looking hard in that direction, perceived the ghost of Master B. The young spectre was dressed in an obsolete fashion, or rather was not so much dressed as put into a case of inferior pepper and salt cloth, made horrible by means of shining buttons. I observed that these buttons went in a double row over each shoulder of the young ghost, and appeared to descend his back. He wore a frill round his neck, his right hand, which I distinctly noticed to be inky, was laid upon his stomach, connecting this action with some feeble pimples on his countenance, and his general air of nausea, I concluded this ghost to be the ghost of a boy who had habitually taken a great deal too much medicine. 
"'Where am I?' said the little spectre in a pathetic voice. "'And why was I born in the calomel days? "'And why did I have all that calomel given me?' "'I replied with sincere earnestness "'that upon my soul I couldn't tell him. "'Where's my little sister?' said the ghost. "'And where are my angelic little wife? "'And where is the boy I went to school with?' I entreated the phantom to be comforted, and above all things to take heart respecting the loss of the boy he went to school with. I represented to him that probably that boy never did, within human experience, come out well when discovered. I urged that I myself had, in later life, turned up several boys whom I went to school with, and none of them had at all answered. I expressed my humble belief that the boy never did answer. I represented that he was a mythic character, a delusion, and a snare. I recounted how, the last time I found him, I found him at a dinner party behind a wall of white cravat, with an inconclusive opinion on every possible subject, and a power of silent boredom absolutely titanic. I related how, on the strength of our having been together at old Doylance's, he had asked himself to breakfast with me, a social offence of the largest magnitude. How, fanning my weak embers of belief in Doylance's boys, I had let him in, and how he had proved to be a fearful wanderer about the earth, pursuing the race of Adam with inexplicable notions concerning the currency, and with a proposition that the Bank of England should, on pain of being abolished, instantly strike off and circulate God knows how many thousand millions of ten and sixpenny notes, the ghost heard me in silence, and with a fixed stare. Barber, it apostrophized me when I had finished. Barber, I repeated, for I am not of that profession. Condemned, said the ghost, to shave a constant change of customers. Now me, now a young man, now thyself as thou art, now thy father, now thy grandfather. Condemned, too, to lie down with a skeleton every night, and to rise with it every morning. I shuddered on hearing this dismal announcement. Barber, pursue me. I had felt, even before the words were uttered, that I was under a spell to pursue the phantom I immediately did so, and was in Master B.'s room no longer. Most people know what long and fatiguing night journeys had been forced upon the witches who used to confess, and who no doubt told the exact truth, particularly as they were always assisted with leading questions, and the torture was always ready. I asseverate that during my occupation of Master B.'s room, I was taken by the ghost that haunted it on expeditions fully as long and wild as any of those. Assuredly I was presented to no shabby old man with a goat's horns and tail, something between Pan and an old clothesman holding conventional reception as stupid as those of real life, and less decent, but I came upon other things which appeared to me to have more meaning. Confident that I speak the truth and shall be believed, I declare without hesitation that I followed the ghost, in the first instance on a broomstick, and afterwards on a rocking horse. The very smell of the animal's paint, especially when I brought it out, by making him warm, I am ready to swear to. I followed the ghost afterwards in a hackney coach, an institution with the peculiar smell of which the present generation is unacquainted, but to which I am again ready to swear as a combination of stable, dog with mange, and very old bellows. In this I appeal to previous generations to confirm or refute me. I pursued the phantom on a headless donkey, at least upon a donkey who was so interested in the state of his stomach that his head was always down there, investigating it, on ponies expressly born to kick up behind, on roundabouts and swings, from fairs, in the first cab, another forgotten institution, where the fair regularly got into bed and was tucked up with the driver. Not to trouble you with a detailed account of all my travels in pursuit of the ghost of Master B, which were longer and more wonderful than those of Sinbad the Sailor, I will confine myself to one experience from which you may judge of many. I was marvellously changed. I was myself, yet not myself. I was conscious of something within me, 
which has been the same all through my life, and which I have always recognized under all its phases and varieties as never altering, and yet I was not the I who had gone to bed in Master B's room. I had the smoothest of faces and shortest of legs, and I had taken another creature like myself, also with the smoothest of faces and the shortest of legs, behind a door, and was confiding to him a proposition of the most astounding nature. This proposition was that we should have a seraglio. The other creature assented warmly. He had no notion of respectability, neither had I. It was the custom of the East. It was the way of the good caliph Harun al-Rashid. Let me have the corrupted name again for once. It is so scented with sweet memories. The usage was highly laudable and most worthy of imitation. Oh, yes, let us, said the other creature with a jump, have a seraglio. It was not because we entertained the faintest doubts of the meritorious character of the Oriental establishment we proposed to import that we perceived it must be kept a secret from Miss Griffin. It was because we knew Miss Griffin to be bereft of human sympathies and incapable of appreciating the greatness of the great Harun. Mystery impenetrably shrouded from Miss Griffin. Then let us entrust it to Miss Buell. We were ten in Miss Griffin's establishment by Hampstead Ponds, eight ladies and two gentlemen. Miss Buell, whom I judged to have attained the ripe age of eight or nine, took the lead in society. I opened the subject to her in the course of the day, and proposed that she should become the favorite. Miss Buell, after struggling with the diffidence so natural to and charming in her adorable sex, expressed herself as flattered by the idea, but wished to know how it was proposed to provide for Miss Pipson. Miss Buell, who was understood to have vowed towards that young lady a friendship, halves, and no secrets, until death, on the church service and lessons complete in two volumes with case and lock. Miss Buell said she could not, as the friend of Pipson, disguise from herself, or me, that Pipson was not one of the common. Now Miss Pipson, having curly hair and blue eyes, which was my idea of anything mortal and feminine that was called fair, I promptly replied that I regarded Miss Pipson in the light of a fair Circassian. And what then? Miss Buell pensively asked. I replied that she must be inveigled by a merchant, brought to me veiled and purchased as a slave. The other creature had already fallen into the second male place in the state, and was set apart for Grand Vizier. He afterwards resisted this disposal of events, but had his hair pulled until he yielded. Shall I not be jealous? Miss Buell inquired, casting down her eyes. Zobeda, no. I replied, you will ever be the favorite sultana, the first place in my heart, and on my throne it will be ever yours. Miss Buell, upon that assurance, consented to propound the idea to her seven beautiful companions. It occurring to me, in the course of the same day, that we knew we could trust a grinning and good-natured soul called Tabby, who was the serving drudge of the house, and had no more figure than one of the beds and upon whose face there was always more or less black lead, I slipped into Miss Buell's hand after supper a little note to that effect, dwelling on the black lead as being in a manner deposited by the finger of Providence, pointing Tabby out for Mesrur, the celebrated chief of the blacks of the harem. There were difficulties in the formation of the desired institution, as there are in all combinations— the other creature showed himself of a low character, and when defeated in aspiring to the throne, pretended to have conscientious scruples about prostrating himself before the caliph, wouldn't call him commander of the faithful, spoke of him slightingly and inconsistently as a mere chap, said he, the other creature, wouldn't play, play, and was otherwise coarse and offensive. This meanness of disposition was, however, put down by the general indignation of united seraglio, and I became blessed in the smiles of eight of the fairest of the daughters of men. The smiles could only be bestowed when Miss Griffin was looking another way, 
and only then in a very wary manner, for there was a legend among the followers of the prophet that she saw with a little round ornament in the middle of the pattern on the back of her shawl. But every day after dinner for an hour we were all together, and then the favorite and the rest of the royal harem competed who should most beguile the leisure of the serene Harun reposing from the cares of the state, which were generally, as in most affairs of state, of an arithmetical character, the commander of the faithful being a fearful boggler at a sum. On these occasions the devoted Masrur, chief of the blacks of the harem, was always in attendance, Miss Griffin usually ringing for that officer at the same time with great vehemence, but never acquitted himself in a manner worthy of his historical reputation. In the first place, his bringing a broom into the divan of the caliph, even when Harun wore on his shoulders the red robe of anger, Miss Pipson's pelisse, though it might be got over for the moment, was never to be quite satisfactorily accounted for. In the second place, his breaking out into grinning exclamations of, Lork, you pretties, was neither eastern nor respectful. In the third place, when specially instructed to say, Bismillah, he always said, Hallelujah. This officer, unlike his class, was too good-humoured altogether, kept his mouth open far too wide, expressed approbation to an incongruous extent, and even once, it was on the occasion of the purchase of the fair Circassian for five hundred thousand purses of gold, and cheap, too, embraced the slave, the favorite, and the caliph all around. Parenthetically, let me say, God bless Monsieur, and there may have been sons and daughters on that tender bosom, softening many a hard day since. Miss Griffin was a model of propriety, and I am at a loss to imagine what the feelings of the virtuous woman would have been if she had known when she paraded us down that Hampstead Road two and two that she was walking with a stately step at the head of polygamy and Mohammedanism. I believe that a mysterious and terrible joy with which the contemplation of Miss Griffin in this unconscious state inspired us and a grim sense prevalent among us that there was a dreadful power in our knowledge of what Miss Griffin, who knew all things that could be learnt out of book, didn't know, were the main spring of the preservation of our secret. It was wonderfully kept, but was once upon the verge of self-betrayal. The danger and escape occurred upon a Sunday. We were all ten ranged in a conspicuous part of the gallery at church, with Miss Griffin at our head, as we were every Sunday, advertising the establishment in an unsecular sort of way, when the description of Solomon in his domestic glory happened to be read. The moment that monarch was thus referred to, conscience whispered me, Thou too, Harun. The officiating minister had a cast in his eye, and it assisted conscience by giving him the appearance of reading personally at me. A crimson blush, attended by a fearful perspiration, suffused my features. The Grand Vizier became more dead than alive, and the whole seraglio reddened, as if the sunset of Baghdad shone direct upon their lovely faces. At this portentous time the awful griffin rose, and balefully surveyed the children of Islam. My own impression was that church and state had entered into a conspiracy with Miss Griffin to expose us, and that we should all be put into white sheets and exhibited in the centre aisle. But so westerly, if I may be allowed the expression of opposites to eastern associations, was Miss Griffin's sense of rectitude that she merely suspected apples, and we were saved. I have called the seraglio united, upon the question solely whether the commander of the faithful durst exercise a right of kissing in that sanctuary of the palace, were its peerless inmates divided. Zobide asserted a counter-right in the favourite to scratch, and the fair Circassian put her face for refuge into a green baize bag originally designed for books. On the other hand, a young antelope of transcendent beauty 
from the faithful plains of Camden Town, whence she had been brought, by traders, in the half-yearly caravan that crossed the intermediate desert after the holidays, held more liberal opinions, but stipulated for limiting the benefit of them to that dog and son of a dog, the Grand Vizier, who had no rights and was not in question. At length the difficulty was compromised by the installation of a very youthful slave as deputy. She, raised upon a stool, officially received upon her cheeks the salutes intended by the gracious Haroun for other sultanas, and was privately rewarded from the coffers of the ladies of the harem. And now it was, at the full height of enjoyment of my bliss, that I became heavily troubled. I began to think of my mother, and what she would say to my taking home at midsummer eight of the most beautiful of the daughters of men, but all unexpected. I thought of the number of beds we made up at our house, of my father's income, and of the baker, and my despondency redoubled. The seraglio and malicious vizier, divining the cause of their lord's unhappiness, did their utmost to augment it. They professed unbounded fidelity, and declared that they would live and die with him. Reduced to the utmost wretchedness by these protestations of attachment, I lay awake for hours at a time, ruminating on my frightful lot. In my despair, I think I might have taken an early opportunity of falling on my knees before Miss Griffin, avowing my resemblance to Solomon, and praying to be dealt with according to the outraged laws of my country, if an unthought-of means of escape had not opened before me. One day we were out walking, two and two, on which occasion the vizier had his usual instructions to take note of the boy at the turnpike, and if he profanely gazed, which he always did, at the beauties of the harem, to have him bowstrung in the course of the night, and it happened that our hearts were veiled in gloom. An unaccountable action on the part of the antelope had plunged the state into disgrace. That charmer, on the representation that the previous day was her birthday, and that vast treasures had been sent in a hamper for its celebration, both baseless assertions, had secretly, but most pressingly, invited thirty-five neighboring princes and princesses to a ball and supper, with a special stipulation that they were not to be fetched till twelve. This wandering of the antelope's fancy led to the surprising arrival at Miss Griffin's door in divers, equipages, and other various escorts, of a great company in full dress, who were deposited on the top step in a flush of high expectancy, and who were dismissed in tears. At the beginning of the double knocks attendant on these ceremonies, the antelope had retired to a back attic and bolted herself in. Miss Griffin had gone so much more and more distracted that at last she had been seen to tear her front. Ultimate capitulation on the part of the offender had been followed by solitude in the linen closet, bread and water, and a lecture to all of vindictive length, in which Miss Griffin had used expressions. Firstly, I believe you all of you knew of it. Secondly, every one of you is as wicked as another. Thirdly, a pack of little wretches. Under these circumstances we were walking drearily along, and I especially, with my Mussulman responsibilities heavy on me, was in a very low state of mind, when a strange man accosted Miss Griffin, and after walking on at her side for a little while, and talking with her, looked at me. Supposing him to be a minion of the law, and that my hour was come, I instantly ran away, with the general purpose of making for Egypt. The whole seraglio cried out, when they saw me making off as fast as my legs would carry me, I had an impression that the first turning on the left, and round by the public house, would be the shortest way to the pyramids. Miss Griffin screamed after me, the faithless vizier ran after me, and the boy at the turnpike dodged me into a corner like a sheep and cut me off. Nobody scolded me when I was taken and brought back. Miss Griffin only said with a stunning gentleness, This was very curious. Why had I run away when the gentleman looked at me? If I had had my breath to answer with, I dare say I should have made no answer, having no breath. I certainly made none. 
Miss Griffin and the strange man took me between them, and walked me back to the palace in a sort of state. But not at all, as I couldn't help feeling with astonishment, in culprit state. When we got there, we went into a room by ourselves, and Miss Griffin called in to her assistance, Mesrur, chief of the dusty guards of the harem. Mesrur, on being whispered to, began to shed tears. "'Bless you, my precious,' said that officer, turning to me. "'Your paws took bitter bad.' I asked with a fluttered heart, "'Is he very ill?' "'Lord, temper the wind to you, my lamb,' said the good Mesrur, kneeling down, that I might have a comforting shoulder for my head to rest on. "'Your paw's dead.' Harun al-Rashid took to flight at the words. The seraglio vanished. From that moment I never again saw one of the eight of the fairest of the daughters of men. I was taken home, and there was a dead at home as well as a death, and we had a sail there. My own little bed was so superciliously looked upon by a power unknown to me, hazily called the trade, that a brass coal scuttle, a roasting jack, and a bird cage were obliged to be put into it to make a lot of it, and then it went for a song. So I heard mentioned, and I wondered what song, and thought what a dismal song it must have been to sing. Then I was sent to a great, cold, bare school of big boys, where everything to eat and wear was thick and clumpy, without being enough, where everybody, large and small, was cruel, where the boys knew all about the sale before I got there, and asked me what I had fetched, and who had brought me, and hooted at me, going, going, gone. I never whispered in that wretched place that I had been Harun, or had had a seraglio, for I knew that if I mentioned my reverses, I should be so worried that I should have to drown myself in the muddy pond near the playground, which looked like the beer. Ah, me, ah, me! No other ghost has haunted the boy's room, my friends, since I have occupied it, than the ghost of my own childhood, the ghost of my own innocence, the ghost of my own airy belief. Many a time have I pursued the phantom, never with this man's stride of mine to come up with it, never with these man's hands of mine to touch it, Never more to this man's heart of mine to hold it in its purity. And here you see me working out, as cheerfully and thankfully as I may, my doom of shaving in the glass, a constant change of customers, and of lying down and rising up with the skeleton allotted to me for my mortal companion. End of Section 2B Section 3 of Three Ghost Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Ghost Stories by Charles Dickens. Section 3 The Trial for Murder. I have always noticed a prevalent want of courage, even among persons of superior intelligence and culture as to importing their own psychological experiences when those have been of a strange sort. Almost all men are afraid that what they could relate in such wise would find no parallel or response in a listener's internal life, and might be suspected or laughed at. A trustful traveller, who should have seen some extraordinary creature in the likeness of a sea serpent, would have no fear of mentioning it. But the same traveller, having had some singular presentiment, impulse, vagary of thought, vision, so-called, dream, or other remarkable mental impression, would hesitate considerably before he would own to it. To this reticence I attribute much of the obscurity in which such subjects are involved. We do not habitually communicate our experiences of these subjective things as we do our experiences of objective creation. The consequence is, that the general stock of experience in this regard appears exceptional, and really is so, in respect of being miserably imperfect. In what I am going to relate, I have no intention of setting up, opposing, 
or supporting any theory whatever. I know the history of the bookseller of Berlin. I have studied the case of the wife of a late astronomer royal, as related by Sir David Brewster. And I have followed the minutest details of a much more remarkable case of spectral illusion occurring within my private circle of friends. It may be necessary to state as to this last, that the sufferer, a lady, was in no degree, however distant, related to me. A mistaken assumption on that head might suggest an explanation of a part of my own case, but only a part, which would be wholly without foundation. It cannot be referred to my inheritance of any developed peculiarity, nor had I ever before any at all similar experience, nor have I ever had any at all similar experience since. It does not signify how many years ago, or how few, a certain murder was committed in England, which attracted great attention. We hear more than enough of murders as they rise in succession to their atrocious eminence, and I would bury the memory of this particular brood if I could, as his body was buried in Newgate Jail. I purposely abstain from giving any direct clue to the criminal's individuality. When the murder was first discovered, no suspicion fell, or I ought rather to say, for I cannot be too precise in my facts, it was nowhere publicly hinted that any suspicion fell on the man who was afterwards brought to trial. As no reference was at that time made to him in the newspapers, it is obviously possible that any description of him can at that time have been given in the newspapers. It is essential that this fact be remembered. Unfolding at breakfast my morning paper, containing the account of that first discovery, I found it to be deeply interesting, and I read it with close attention. I read it twice, if not three times. The discovery had been made in a bedroom, and, when I laid down the paper, I was aware of a flash, rush, flow. I do not know what to call it. No word I can find is satisfactorily descriptive, in which I seemed to see that bedroom passing through my room, like a picture impossibly painted on a running river. Though almost instantaneous in its passing, it was perfectly clear, so clear that I distinctly, and with a sense of relief, observed the absence of the dead body from the bed. It was in no romantic place that I had this curious sensation, but in chambers in Piccadilly, very near to the corner of St. James Street. It was entirely new to me. I was in my easy chair at the moment and the sensation was accompanied with a peculiar shiver which started the chair from its position. But it is to be noted that the chair ran easily on casters. I went to one of the windows. There are two in the room, and the room is on the second floor, to refresh my eyes with the moving objects down in Piccadilly. It was a bright autumn morning, and the street was sparkling and cheerful. The wind was high. As I looked out, it brought down from the park a quantity of fallen leaves, which a gust took and whirled into a spiral pillar. As the pillar fell and the leaves dispersed, I saw two men on the opposite side of the way, going from west to east. They were one behind the other. The foremost man often looked back over his shoulder. The second man followed him at a distance of some thirty paces, with his right hand menacingly raised. First. The singularity and steadiness of this threatening gesture in so public a thoroughfare attracted my attention. And next, the more remarkable circumstance that nobody heeded it. Both men threaded their way among the other passengers with a smoothness hardly consistent even with the action of walking on a pavement. And no single creature that I could see gave them place, touched them, or looked after them. In passing before my windows, they both stared up at me. I saw their two faces very distinctly, and I knew that I could recognize them anywhere. Not that I had consciously noticed anything very remarkable in either face, except that the man who went first had an unusually luring appearance, and that the face of the man who followed him was the color of impure wax. I am a bachelor, and my valet and his wife constitute my whole establishment. My occupation is in a certain branch bank, and I wish that my duties as head of a department were as light as they are popularly supposed to be. They kept me in town that autumn, when I stood in need of change. 
I was not ill, but I was not well. My reader is to make the most that can be reasonably made of my feeling jaded, having a depressing sense upon me of a monotonous life, and being slightly dyspeptic. I am assured by my renowned doctor that my real state of health at that time justifies no stronger description, and I quote his own from his written answer to my request for it. As the circumstances of the murder, gradually unraveling, took stronger and stronger possession of the public mind, I kept them away from mine by knowing as little about them as was possible in the midst of the universal excitement. But I knew that a verdict of willful murder had been found against the suspected murderer, and that he had been committed to Newgate for trial. I also know that his trial had been postponed over one sessions of the Central Criminal Court, on the ground of general prejudice and want of time for the preparation of the defence. I may further have known, but I believe I did not, when, or about when, the sessions to which his trial stood postponed would come on. My sitting-room, bedroom, and dressing-room are all on one floor. With the last there is no communication but through the bedroom. True, there is a door in it, once communicating with the staircase, but a part of the fitting of my bath has been, and had then been for some years, fixed across it. At the same period, and as a part of the same arrangement, the door had been nailed up and canvassed over. I was standing in my bedroom late one night, giving some directions to my servant before he went to bed. My face was towards the only available door of communication with the dressing-room, and it was closed. My servant's back was towards that door. While I was speaking to him, I saw it open, and a man look in, who very earnestly and mysteriously beckoned to me. That man was the man who had gone second of the two along Piccadilly, and whose face was of the color of impure wax. The figure, having beckoned, drew back, and closed the door. With no longer pause than was made by my crossing the bedroom, I opened the dressing-room door and looked in. I had a lighted candle already in my hand. I felt no inward expectation of seeing the figure in the dressing-room, and I did not see it there. Conscious that my servant stood amazed, I turned round to him, and said, Derek, could you believe that in my cold senses I fancied I saw a... As I there laid my hand upon his breast, with a sudden start he trembled violently, and said, Oh Lord, yes, sir, a dead man beckoning! Now I do not believe that this John Derrick, my trusty and attached servant for more than twenty years, had any impression whatever of having seen any such figure until I touched him. The change in him was so startling when I touched him, that I fully believe he derived his impression in some occult manner from me at that instant. I bade John Derrick bring some brandy, and I gave him a dram, and was glad to take one myself. Of what had preceded that night's phenomenon, I told him not a single word. Reflecting on it, I was absolutely certain that I had never seen that face before, except on the one occasion in Piccadilly. Comparing its expression when beckoning at the door with its expression when it had stared up at me as I stood at my window, I came to the conclusion that on the first occasion it had sought to fasten itself upon my memory, and that on the second occasion it had made sure of being immediately remembered. I was not very comfortable that night, though I felt a certainty, difficult to explain, that the figure would not return. At daylight I fell into a heavy sleep, from which I was awakened by John Derrick's coming to my bedside with a paper in his hand. This paper, it appeared, had been the subject of an altercation at the door between its bearer and my servant. It was a summons to me to serve upon a jury at the forthcoming sessions of the Central Criminal Court at the Old Bailey. I had never before been summoned on such a jury, as John Derrick well knew. He believed, I am not certain at this hour whether with reason or otherwise, that that class of jurors were customarily chosen on a lower qualification than mine, and he had at first refused to accept the summons. The man who served it had taken the matter very coolly. He had said that my attendance or non-attendance was nothing to him. There the summons was and I should deal with it at my own peril, and not at his. For a day or two, I was undecided whether to respond to this call, or to take no notice of it. 
I was not conscious of the slightest mysterious bias, influence, or attraction, one way or other. Of that I am as strictly sure as of every other statement that I make here. Ultimately, I decided, as a break in the monotony of my life, that I would go. The appointed morning was a raw morning in the month of November. There was a dense brown fog in Piccadilly, and it became positively black and in the last degree oppressive east of Temple Bar. I found the passages and staircases of the courthouse flaringly lighted with gas, and the court itself similarly illuminated. I think that, until I was conducted by officers into the old court and saw its crowded state, I did not know that the murderer was to be tried that day. I think that, until I was so helped into the old court with considerable difficulty, I did not know into which of the two courts sitting my summons would take me. But this must not be received as a positive assertion, for I am not completely satisfied in my mind on either point. I took my seat in the place appropriated to jurors in waiting, and I looked about the court as well as I could through the cloud of fog and breath that was heavy in it. I noticed the black vapor hanging like a murky curtain outside the great windows, and I noticed the stifled sound of wheels and the straw or tan that was littered in the street. Also, the hum of the people gathered there, which a shrill whistle or a louder song or hail than the rest occasionally pierced. Soon afterwards the judges, two in number, entered, and took their seats. The buzz in the court was awfully hushed. The direction was given to put the murderer to the bar. He appeared there, and in that same instant I recognized in him the first of the two men who had gone down Piccadilly. If my name had been called then, I doubt if I could have answered to it audibly. But it was called about sixth or eighth in the panel, and I was by that time able to say, Here, now, observe. As I stepped into the box, the prisoner, who had been looking on attentively, but with no sign of concern, became violently agitated, and beckoned to his attorney. The prisoner's wish to challenge me was so manifest that it occasioned a pause, during which the attorney, with his hand upon the dock, whispered with his client, and shook his head. I afterwards had it from that gentleman, that the prisoner's first affrighted words to him were, at all hazards, challenge that man, but that, as he would give no reason for it, and admitted that he had not even known my name until he heard it called and I appeared, it was not done. Both on the ground already explained, that I wished to avoid reviving the unwholesome memory of that murderer, and also because a detailed account of his long trial is by no means indispensable to my narrative, I shall confine myself closely to such incidents in the ten days and nights during which we, the jury, were kept together, as directly bear on my own curious personal experience. It is in that, and not in the murderer, that I seek to interest my reader. It is to that, and not to a page of the Newgate calendar, that I beg attention. I was chosen foreman of the jury. On the second morning of the trial, after evidence had been taken for two hours, I heard the church clock strike. Happening to cast my eyes over my brother jurymen, I found an inexplicable difficulty in counting them. I counted them several times, yet always with the same difficulty. In short, I made them one too many. I touched the brother juryman, whose place was next to me, and I whispered to him, Oblige me by counting us. He looked surprised by the request, but turned his head and counted. Why, says he suddenly, we are third. But no, it's not possible. No, we are twelve. According to my counting that day, we were always right in detail but in the gross we were always one too many. There was no appearance, no figure, to account for it, but I had now an inward foreshadowing of the figure that was surely coming. The jury were housed at the London Tavern. We all slept in one large room on separate tables, and we were constantly in the charge and under the eye of the officers sworn to hold us in safe keeping. I see no reason for suppressing the real name of that officer. He was intelligent, highly polite, and obliging, and, I was glad to hear, 
much respected in the city. He had an agreeable presence, good eyes, enviable back whiskers, and a fine sonorous voice. His name was Mr. Harker. When we turned into our twelve beds at night, Mr. Harker's bed was drawn across the door. On the night of the second day, not being disposed to lie down, and seeing Mr. Harker sitting on his bed, I went and sat beside him, and offered him a pinch of snuff. As Mr. Harker's hand touched mine in taking it from my box, a peculiar shiver crossed him, and he said, Who is this? Following Mr. Harker's eyes, and looking along the room, I saw again the figure I expected, the second of the two men who had gone down Piccadilly. I rose, and advanced a few steps, then stopped, and looked round at Mr. Harker. He was quite unconcerned, laughed, and said in a pleasant way, I thought for a moment we had a thirteenth juryman, without a bed, but I see it is the moonlight. Making no revelation to Mr. Harker, but inviting him to take a walk with me to the end of the room, I watched what the figure did. It stood for a few moments by the bedside of each of my eleven brother jurymen, close to the pillow. It always went to the right-hand side of the bed, and always passed out crossing the foot of the next bed. It seemed, from the action of the head, merely to look down pensively at each recumbent figure. It took no notice of me, or of my bed, which was that nearest to Mr. Harker's. It seemed to go out where the moonlight came in, through a high window, as by an aerial flight of stairs. Next morning at breakfast, it appeared that everybody present had dreamed of the murdered man last night, except myself and Mr. Harker. I now felt as convinced that the second man who had gone down Piccadilly was the murdered man, so to speak, as if it had been borne into my comprehension by his immediate testimony. But even this took place, and in a manner for which I was not at all prepared. On the fifth day of the trial, when the case for the prosecution was drawing to a close, a miniature of the murdered man, missing from his bedroom upon the discovery of the deed, and afterwards found in a hiding place where the murderer had been seen digging, was put in evidence. Having been identified by the witness under examination, it was handed up to the bench, and then sanded down to be inspected by the jury. As an officer in a black gown was making his way with it across to me, the figure of the second man who had gone down Piccadilly impetuously started from the crowd, caught the miniature from the officer, and gave it to me with his own hands at the same time saying, in a low and hollow tone, before I saw the miniature which was in a locket, I was younger then, and my face was not then drained of blood. It also came between me and the brother juryman to whom I would have given the miniature, and between him and the brother juryman to whom he would have given it, and so passed it on through the whole of our number, and back into my possession. Not one of them, however, detected this. At table, and generally when we were shut up together in Mr. Harker's custody, we had from the first naturally discussed the day's proceedings a good deal. On that fifth day, the case for the prosecution being closed, and we having that side of the question in the completed shape before us, our discussion was more animated and serious. Among our number was a vestryman, the densest idiot I have ever seen at large who met the plainest evidence with the most preposterous objections, and who was sided with by two flabby parochial parasites, all the three impaneled from a district so delivered over to fever that they ought to have been upon their own trial for five hundred murders. When these mischievous blockheads were at their loudest, which was towards midnight, while some of us were already preparing for bed, I again saw the murdered man. He stood grimly behind them, beckoning to me. On my going towards them, and striking into the conversation, he immediately retired. This was the beginning of a separate series of appearances, confined to that long room in which we were confined. Whenever a knot of my brother jurymen laid their heads together, I saw the head of the murdered man among theirs. Whenever their comparison of notes was going against him, he would solemnly and irresistibly beckon to me. It will be borne in mind that down to the production of the miniature on the fifth day of the trial, 
I had never seen the appearance in court. Three changes occurred now that we entered on the case for the defense. Two of them I will mention together first. The figure was now in court continually, and it never there addressed himself to me, but always to the person who was speaking at the time. For instance, the throat of the murdered man had been cut straight across. In the opening speech for the defense, it was suggested that the deceased might have cut his own throat. At that very moment, the figure, with its throat in the dreadful condition referred to, this it had concealed before, stood at the speaker's elbow, motioning across and across its windpipe, now with the right hand, now with the left, vigorously suggesting to the speaker himself the impossibility of such a wound having been self-inflicted by either hand. For another instance, a witness to character, a woman, deposed to the prisoners being the most amiable of mankind. The figure at that instant stood on the floor before her, looking her full in the face, and pointing out the prisoner's evil countenance with an extended arm and an outstretched finger. The third change now to be added impressed me strongly as the most marked and striking of all. I do not theorize upon it. I accurately state it, and there leave it. Although the appearance was not itself perceived by those whom it addressed, its coming close to such persons was invariably attended by some trepidation or disturbance on their part. It seemed to me as if it were prevented, by laws to which I was not amenable, from fully revealing itself to others, and yet as if it could invisibly, dumbly, and darkly overshadow their minds. And when the leading counsel for the defense suggested that hypothesis of suicide, and the figure stood at the learned gentleman's elbow, frightfully sawing at its severed throat, it is undeniable that the counsel faltered in his speech, lost for a few seconds the thread of his ingenious discourse, wiped his forehead with his handkerchief, and turned extremely pale. When the witness to character was confronted by the appearance, her eyes most certainly did follow the direction of its pointed finger, and rest in great hesitation and trouble upon the prisoner's face. Two additional illustrations will suffice. On the eighth day of the trial, after the pause which was every day made early in the afternoon for a few minutes' rest and refreshment, I came back into court with the rest of the jury some little time before the return of the judges. Standing up in the box and looking about me, I thought the figure was not there, until, chancing to raise my eyes to the gallery, I saw it bending forward, and leaning over a very decent woman, as if to assure itself whether the judges had resumed their seats or not. Immediately afterwards that woman screamed, fainted, and was carried out. So with the venerable, sagacious, and patient judge who conducted the trial. When the case was over, and he settled himself on his papers to sum up, the murdered man, entering by the judge's door, advanced to his lordship's desk, and looked eagerly over his shoulder at the pages of his notes which he was turning. A change came over his lordship's face. His hand stopped. The peculiar shiver that I knew so well passed over him. He faltered. Excuse me, gentlemen, for a few moments. I am somewhat oppressed by the vitiated air. And did not recover until he had drunk a glass of water. Through all the monotony of six of those interminable ten days, the same judges and others on the bench, the same murderer in the dock, the same lawyers at the table, the same tones of question and answer rising to the roof of the court, the same scratching of the judge's pen, the same ushers going in and out, the same lights kindled at the same hour when there had been any natural light of day, the same foggy curtain outside the great windows when it was foggy, the same rain pattering and dripping when it was rainy, the same footmarks of turnkeys and prisoner day after day on the same sawdust, the same keys locking and unlocking the same heavy doors, through all the wearisome monotony which made me feel as if I had been foreman of the jury for a vast period of time, and Piccadilly had flourished covily with Babylon. The murdered man never lost one trace of his distinctness in my eyes, nor was he at any moment less distinct than anybody else. I must not omit, as a matter of fact, that I never once saw the appearance which I call by the name of the murdered man look at the murderer. Again and again I wondered, why does he not? But he never did. Nor did he look at me, after the production of the miniature, 
until the last closing minutes of the trial arrived. We retired to consider, at seven minutes before ten at night. The idiotic vestryman and his two parochial parasites gave us so much trouble that we twice returned into court to beg to have certain extracts from the judge's notes re-read. Nine of us had not the smallest doubt about those passages, neither, I believe, had anyone in the court. The dunder-headed triumvirate, having no idea but obstruction, disputed them for that very reason. At length we prevailed, and finally the jury returned into court at ten minutes past twelve. The murdered man at that time stood directly opposite the jury box, on the other side of the court. As I took my place, his eyes rested on me with great attention. He seemed satisfied, and slowly shook a great grey veal, which he carried on his arm for the first time, over his head and whole forearm, as I gave in our verdict. Guilty. The veal collapsed. All was gone, and his place was empty. The murderer, being asked by the judge, according to usage, whether he had anything to say before sentence of death should be passed upon him, indistinctly muttered something which was described in the leading newspapers of the following day as a few rambling, incoherent and half-audible words, in which he was understood to complain that he had not had a fair trial, because the foreman of the jury was prepossessed against him. The remarkable declaration that he really made was this. My lord, I knew I was a doomed man when the foreman of my jury came into the box. My lord, I knew he would never let me off, because, before I was taken, he somehow got to my bedside in the night, woke me, and put a rope round my neck. End of section 3 And the end of Three Ghost Stories All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.